Well, I was asked to say a few words about the soft power of Asia. And uh, I must say that um, it's a vast subject and I have about 10 or 12 minutes. I'm not going to do anything more than skim the surface of it. But when we talk about soft power, what is power to begin with? Power is basically the ability to alter the behavior of others to get what you want, to get them to give you what you want, to allow you to get what you want. And there are essentially three ways you can do that. There's through coercion, sticks, what we in India called danda. There's inducements, cash, other kinds of allure, payments, or what you might call carrots. So the sticks and the carrots. And then there's a third kind of power, and that is the power of attraction. That is what soft power is all about. Now, what do we mean by attraction? It means that essentially there are things that hard power alone cannot achieve. Traditionally, we've always thought the hard power what is what won you wars, but even that stopped being true in the late 20th century. We know the biggest military power of the era, the US, lost the Vietnam War. The Soviets were defeated in Afghanistan, largely by a ragtag bunch of Mujahideen. And even as recently as the Iraq War, when the occupation happened after the military victory, you discovered the truth of Talleyrand's old adage that the one thing you cannot do with a bayonet is to sit on it. So the hard power might have worked to win the battle. It didn't help to actually run the country. Now, this is where the issue of what hard power and soft power is comes up. The man who came up with the concept of soft power is an old friend of mine, Professor Joseph Nye at Harvard. And his argument was that soft power rests essentially on three things. Any country so far rests on its culture, on its political values, and on its foreign policy. So your culture, if it's attractive to others, that gives you soft power. If it's your political values are moral, upright, uh, respected around the world, that gives you soft power. If your foreign policies are credible, legitimate, carry moral authority, that gives you soft power. That's the fundamental thesis. And of course, I would go slightly beyond that and say it's even more than that. It's part of what the world's perception of you is. In other words, whereas um, uh, you hear the name of a particular country and that evokes certain ideas in your mind about that country, that is that country's soft power. So you, if you hear the name of a country and you have largely negative associations, it won't matter how strong or powerful or rich that country is, those negative associations will color your reaction to it. And to my mind, that is the real thing. Hard power is exercised. Soft power is evoked. And there, if you look at uh, the way in which soft power comes up, it isn't necessarily governmental action. In the case of the United States, which in many, many ways, when Nye first came up with his theory, he saw as the archetype of soft power. It wasn't the voice of America or the Fulbright scholarships that made America's soft power so influential. It's the fact that it's the land of Boeing and Intel, of Coke and Jeans, of, of McDonald's and Starbucks, of Hollywood and Disney World, of Microsoft and the iPhone. All of these products that we take for granted and use every day around the world all come from this one country. Automobiles and television sets, for that matter, were invented there. And therefore, that predisposes you to admire and think well of the US. That was the argument. But of course, it's also true that the same logic can apply to many other cultures. It's very interesting, for example, that way back in the 19th century, when the French lost a war with Prussia in 1870, you know the first thing they did after their defeat when the Germans withdrew, the Prussians withdrew, they actually created the Alliance Francaise because they decided their strength lay in culture, not necessarily in military strength, and they were going to promote France by promoting French culture around the world. And others have followed the same example. We all know about the British Council. Uh, much more recently, the Chinese have created Confucius Institutes, uh, hundreds of them around the world, for precisely the same purpose. And this is, this is um, an interesting way of of looking at the way in which soft power is used by countries around the world. In a subsequent book called The Paradox of American Power, Joseph Nye tried to apply his theories to other countries, and he said there are three types of countries that successfully use soft power. Those whose dominant cultures and ideals are closer to prevailing global norms. Now, what did he say those global norms were? He said liberalism, pluralism, and autonomy. Then he said, those countries which have access to multiple channels of information and therefore have greater ability to influence how issues are framed. And the third thing he said was, of course, that those whose credibility is enhanced by both their domestic and their international performance. Now, if you look at Asia with those yardsticks, then the biggest economy in Asia, the most 
the biggest rising power in Asia, China falters on the soft power thing. It doesn't have this problem, uh, this advantage of its dominant culture being close to prevailing global norms because liberalism, pluralism, autonomy are not the dominant issues in a much more authoritarian state structure in communist rule China. Similarly, access to multiple channels of information within China, yes, globally, no. Information channels come from elsewhere. And of course, the domestic and international perception of the country, it's impressive, but is it attractive? These are questions. So one could argue that a country like China falters on these first two criteria. Uh, and if we look at the other part of Asia, the Arab world, the Arab world has a lot going for it, but it also has tremendous challenges in terms of perceptions as to what the problems and associations and identification of those countries is in the popular imagination. The UAE, of course, remains a shining exception. The UAE tends to associate positively in people's minds around the world. It's less true of other parts of the Arab world. India, in many ways, is the country that I spend most time thinking about in this context. And I would say that amongst India's great strengths is the fact that it is, in, it, it is a, um, a land of multiple faiths that have gone into making its civilization, going back to we have the oldest Jewish community in the world outside Palestine, we have the oldest Christian community in the world outside Palestine, we have amongst the oldest Islamic communities in the world outside the Arab Peninsula, uh, because all of these groups came to India, in fact they all came to my state first, uh, and, and, and they found a warm welcome uh, because that was the nature of Indian society, and they grew and found their, found their uh, place there, and this attitude over several thousand years of civilization has been confirmed by today's democratic India, which has managed the art of saying, look, we can survive differences of caste, of creed, of color, of culture, of cuisine, of, of conviction, of custom and costume, and still rally around a consensus. And what's a consensus? That in a large, diverse democracy like ours, you don't really need to agree all the time as long as you agree on the ground rules of how you will disagree. And that's the consensus we manage and how to do without consensus. In fact, the result of this is the British historian E.P. Thompson wrote a generation ago that India is, he said, the most important country for the future of the world because he said all the influences in the world run through this society. And I'm still quoting, there is not a thought that is being thought in the East or the West that is not active in some Indian mind. Unquote. Well, I'm glad a Brit said that and not an Indian, but the fact is that that is ultimately the great strength of India. And in the information era that we're all living in, the fact is that soft power tends to spread through these multiple channels of communication that Joseph Knight talked about. So Bollywood, for example, becomes a huge hit for India. I met a Senegalese gentleman in New York who told me that his illiterate mother takes a bus from her village to the capital city of Dakar in Senegal once a month just to see the latest Bollywood film. Okay, she can't understand the Hindi dialogue, obviously. She's illiterate, so she can't read the French subtitles. But our films are made to be understood despite such handicaps. And she has a great time watching the song and the dance and the action, and she goes away with stars in her eyes about India as a result. And it translates into policy, because I have met African heads of state, foreign ministers, who've said to me exactly the same thing, how much they used to look forward to seeing a Bollywood film come to the nearest town when they were growing up in their countries in Africa. Uh, in Afghanistan, for many years, the biggest influence India had in Afghanistan was a television soap opera called Kyonki Saas Bhi Kabhi Bahuthi, which was uh, 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 an opportunity for the Afghan people to discuss family problems that are normally literally hidden behind the veil. And so this show attracted so much attention in Afghanistan, it captured by some estimates 92% of the television audience in that country. It became so controversial that because it was keeping people away from other activities, from religious functions, some of the mullahs started saying this is, uh, this is beginning to affect religious observances. Crime started going up at the hour of the show, which was 8.30 every evening, because even the people who were supposed to protect property were watching TV rather than, so there was a famous story of, uh, written by a British news agency, Reuters, not an Indian journalist about how in mazar -e sharif robbers actually stripped a car of everything, windshield wiper, hubcaps, any detachable part, side view mirrors, everything, and then wrote on the windshield in a reference to this show's heroine, Tulsi, they wrote, Tulsi is in long live Tulsi. <laughs> they got their, their car parts uh, thanks to the popularity of the show. And we go beyond that. Cuisine, Indian cuisine has spread around the world, is also influencing 
people. Today in the United Kingdom, in Britain, Indian restaurants employ more people than the coal mining, shipbuilding, and iron and steel industries combined. So the empire can strike back. And the fact is that uh, uh, this summer, uh, a little joke went around the internet when the prime minister went to claim his re-election mantle from the queen in a Jaguar, which of course is now an Indian-owned car, escorted by a Land Rover also made by an Indian-owned company. And that kind of post-colonial frisson shows how, how the, 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 the influence of India has transformed itself. But I, I, I don't want to go on about India so much. The larger point is these are not things that have to do with government propaganda. Most people see propaganda for what it is. It's about the things that happen when you're trying to just be yourselves. And so in today's world, when we talk about soft power, for any country, it's about being the land of the better story. It's about being the land that people like to tell positive stories about. It's about essentially um, realizing that, for example, for China, Kung Fu, or here perhaps Umali, are far more uh, attractive to people outside than military successes. Um, uh, the Chinese tried to advance soft power very consciously in the Beijing Olympics, the glittering opening ceremony and so on, but a lot of the coverage focused on the repressions of free expression at the same time as the Beijing Olympics, and that undermined them. So China, through its, uh, its, 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 its uh, political restrictions, or, or the Russians through their military adventure in Ukraine, have found that you can always win the hard power battle and still lose the soft power war. Uh, Arab countries, to my mind, the rich Arab countries, are actually gaining enormously in soft power by the simple act of generosity. Very few people around the world are beginning to, I mean, people are now beginning to realize that one of the great attractions of a country like the UAE is that you are spending double what the UN is asking you to spend of your GDP in assistance to the poor countries of the world. 1.5% of GDP is being spent by the Gulf Arab countries assisting other people. And I think that is the kind of, as word gets out about that, your soft power and attraction will go up as well. So I'm going to wrap up here, but since I mentioned India so favorably, let me add one more internal condition, which applies to all countries, which is to have that international credibility, you've also got to be internally credible. You have to be able to fix your internal problems. In our case, our challenges of poverty, our challenges of maintaining the great civilizational pluralism that is such a strength in our society. If forces of intolerance rise in our society, they will undermine our own soft power. And that's something we need to realize, and that applies to everybody else as well. If you want to be the land of the better story, better be a land where the stories that are told about you, not the stories you want people to tell, but the stories that people tell about you anyway, whether you want to hear it or not, are all good stories, positive stories, stories that make you look like and feel like the desirable country you want to be seen as. I hope, therefore, that Asia's soft power will continue rising in the world, and increasingly in the 21st century, that is really the only way forward. Thank you all very much, and have a great conversation.